I'm excited to let you know that we are looking at the last named group of people in Hebrews 11 today. We're looking at the prophets. We've been on a journey this year of examining the life of faith. We've been looking at the agricultural imagery, learning how farmers bring about great harvests, and then we've been taking the principles from the natural that Jesus references in his teaching, that Paul references in his teaching, and are found throughout scripture, and we are learning how we can bear good fruit in our lives. We know that the fruit we're supposed to bear is the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love and joy kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We are to live a life of praise to God. That is the whole reason for our existence, is God created us to be his image bearers. God created us to reflect his character to the nation so that all people would come to know him and bow the knee to his sovereign grace. And so we're gonna be looking through that four-step strategy of a farmer, cultivate people with faith, sow the good seed of God's grace, the gospel, into their hearts and minds, care for them and their stories so that they become mature, so that they can bear the good fruit of glory to God. And before I dive into our text in Hebrews 11, I do want to say this. Never forget that we can do nothing apart from him. You know, we talk about the hard work of a farmer. We've been talking about the hard work of a farmer all year. But every good farmer knows they have to work hard, but it's only God who's gonna bring the increase. It's only God who can bring about, about any kind of good fruit from that seed, okay? We can learn the science of it. We can learn everything there is to learn about agricultural science, but at the end of the day, it's a miracle. At the end of the day, it's a miracle. Just like babies, they're miracles, you know? We can learn the science, we can figure it all out, but it's still mind-blowing to think of how life comes. And so right now, we're gonna open up our scriptures to Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 40. If you'd like to read along with me, the New Pew Bibles that were dedicated last week in memory of Jane Reese are available. It's the same translation that I teach from, the New American Standard. Uh, Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 40. This is the same scripture we've been looking at for many weeks. Uh, we've actually now walked through all of Hebrews 11, and next week, we're going to be looking at Hebrews 12 for one of the concluding messages of this series. Okay, pretty exciting. Here we go. For a message called a faith that calls people home. Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 40. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, we've talked about all of them. We took a whole week to talk about each of them. And today, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. That's Daniel, by the way, in Daniel chapter six. Quenched the power of fire. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in uh, Daniel chapter 3. Okay, and it continues on. I'm not, I'm not going to do that for every single one of these, but I'm just telling you, there are people who are not named in Hebrews 11 that are referenced in Hebrews 11, like Elijah and Elisha also get alluded to. Jeremiah gets alluded to. Isaiah gets alluded to. Um, Uriah, a very unknown prophet, gets alluded to. So just know that. These descriptions are alluding to specific people who God used for his glory. So quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreigners to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Now I do have to comment about that one. That's Elijah with the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings 17 and the prophet Elisha with the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4. So right here, these, these, these powerful examples, and we're gonna look at some of them more next week as we bring this message to the series to conclusion. Okay, so we keep going. And others were tortured, <laughs> most of them, not accepting their release so they might obtain a better resurrection. They weren't scared of death. They had something to die for. And my argument is you have nothing to live for until you know what's worth dying for. 
And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, and all of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Oh, Father, this is your word, eternal and everlasting. As we look at this scripture today, specifically as we look at the prophets today, help us to understand what is the faith that we are supposed to emulate? What is it we are supposed to learn from each of these people so that we may be a part of that great cloud of witnesses, so that we may have a story that points to your story. Lord, we know that even with the mustard seed of faith, we can move mountains. And so right now, pray, I, Father, that you bestow faith on each person within the sound of my voice so that they can move the mountains through the word of God, through the authority of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the prophets, that's the group we're looking at. Prophets are found throughout the Bible from cover to cover. As I briefly illustrated already in that above passage, I just quickly did that. Now, what's a prophet? I'm going to give you what I think is a very clear definition of a prophet. A prophet is a person inspired to proclaim or reveal divine will or purpose. I'll say it again. A person inspired to proclaim or reveal divine will or purpose. Now, I prefer this definition because it's inclusive to both forthtelling and foretelling. Okay, and that's something that we need to wrap our minds around. It's important because today, especially in our very sensationalistic culture, we prefer to only look at prophets as people who do the divine forecasting of the future, the people who foretell, okay? But there's so much more to prophecy. There's so much more to prophecy than the sensational foretelling, okay? I'm not saying that doesn't happen anymore. It still happens, but there's so much more, and I think we miss out when we only look at one aspect of what the prophet's role was. You see, prophecy is a calling forth of God's will in a specific time and place with a divine purpose in mind, okay? When done properly, preaching is a prophetic work of the Spirit, okay? Let me say it again, just in case you're like, what? If done properly, preaching is a prophetic activity, it is forthtelling. It is saying, thus says the Lord for your life today in this culture here and now. It's what Paul did when he brought the gospel of Jesus and he contextualized it to all those early church locations that you find in the book of Acts. He was saying, this is God's will for your life when you thank God in all circumstances. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification, which is, you know, he foretold to them, this is what pleases God. This is how you live for his glory. In that last song, especially that we sang, that was filled with so much foretelling to give us hope to persevere in these dark days. Now, it's important to realize, as we learn from the prophets, a faith that calls people home, that we... I, elders of the church, none of us can foretell who God has chosen. <laughs> That's only God's arena, okay? None of us know. So, because we cannot foretell who God has chosen and who will be saved, we are called to foretell to all. Does that make sense? 
Because foretelling is so much a part of who God is. God is the one who's omniscient. God is the one who's omnipotent. God is the one who's to be exalted above all created things. He is holy, set apart from his creation. He is to be glorified. He is to be praised. Only in the mind of God does he know. We, in our limited understandings, are just judgmental, self-righteous, other words you can put in there. When we think we can tell, we're to forth tell. We are to proclaim that Jesus has died once for all. And all means all, and that's all all means. And so let's tell everybody the good news. We should not do the foretelling of who's in and out. We only see with limited eyes. We are to forth tell. We are to prophesy, thus saith the Lord. Let me read to you this beautiful scripture from Hebrews 7, verses 25 to 27. I love this scripture. Hebrews 7, a couple chapters right before our study. Previews, Hebrews 7, verses 25 to 27 says this, Therefore, he, Jesus, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love that. He always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't it good to know that Jesus is praying for you right now at the right hand of the Father? That's good news. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest Jesus, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this Jesus did once for all when he offered up himself. That is the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins once for all past, present, future, covered in the blood of Jesus through faith. That is God's grace at work in you. We are to share that. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that so whoever shall believe in him, whether you think they should be in or out, whether you'd like to share eternity with them or not, whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have forever life. That's right. No beginning, no end that's what it means you enter into his eternal life you are changed you are made new you are a new creation that is the good news and so now let's learn how to get that into us okay what do we learn from the prophets of how to take this good news and get it into us okay because here's something we need to learn go to ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 with me ephesians was one of the letters of paul if you want to be fancy You can call it an epistle, which means letter, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, okay, in your pew Bible. I can say this for the first time. In your pew Bible, that's page 1055. That's kind of cool. It's the first time I've been able to say that since I teach from the New American Standard, and we now have New American Standard pew Bibles. Check this out. What does it say here? Uh, verse 11, sorry. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Jesus gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Okay, I'm gonna be doing more teaching on Ephesians 4 in November, okay? But for now, I just wanna make it clear that when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, after descending, he ascended and he gave gifts, And guess what he gave? He gave spiritually gifted people to lead the church, to equip the saints for the good work of ministry so that we would be built up in unity, so that we would be one mature body. That's the gifts. That's one part of what God gave to his church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to build up the body of Christ. All five spiritually gifted persons 
We have the same purpose. It's to build up the body of Christ in love through the equipping of the hagias, the saints, the called out ones, the ecclesia, the church. You who have been called out of the world and the corruption of this world into a relationship with God so that you may partake of his divine nature. That's 2 Peter 1. He's given you everything you need for life and godliness. That's the promise of God from 2 Peter 1. My job, my calling, as one who has been gifted to the church, is to equip you for the good works which proclaim Jesus. We cannot see prophets as something of a previous dispensation, as of a previous time. Okay, prophets are a part of the work of the church. They're a current reality. They're one of the fivefold functions of the elders of the church today. And we must hear the message of the prophets, which has been unchanging through the millennia. And I want you to get this. Okay, here it is. What is the unchanging message of the prophets throughout millennia? For thousands of years, it's return to me, come home. It's the voice of God spoken through a chosen vessel to declare the will of God, which is unchanging. I have come to make my habitation with you. From the beginning, this has been my purpose. Return. Come home. And that comes with a lot of dot, dot, dots in all those things those prophets had to say to rebuke people who were doing things other than being with God and being at home with God. But let's go to Joel 2. Old Testament, Joel 2, verses 12 to 13. I'm just gonna read it to you. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me. Love this section of scripture. The prophet Joel says, God says to the prophet Joel, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God. And then get this, he quotes from previous passages. Okay? Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. How did the prophet Joel proclaim the message returned to me he described god he foretold about god he said this is who god is this is how god has revealed himself he is worthy of your worship and praise return to him now where else do we see this here's a couple quick examples so we had joel the prophet joel now go to the prophet jeremiah chapter 4 verses 1 to 2 we call him the weeping prophet If you will return, O Israel, you hear it? If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things from my presence and will not waver and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him and in him they will glory. Do you hear it? over and over again hear the prophets calling the people back to covenant faithfulness with God. Okay, here's another example. Ezekiel 33 verse 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know? God himself said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And this is coming through an Old Testament prophet. Okay, so all of you who think that the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God, please, please, one God. Okay, same God. Okay, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? And then let's look at one more Hosea. I love Hosea. Hosea's whole life was prophetic. Oh, crazy. But true, man, if you want to get, have your mind blown about how God can use someone's whole story to point to his story, look at the story of Hosea. Okay, Hosea 12, verse 6. Therefore, return to your God, observe kindness and justice, and wait for your God continually. Wow. 
Now, turn with me to Matthew. I was trying to move along there by not having us turn to every single one of those scriptures, but be noble like a Berean and go ahead and look up every single one of those scriptures. If you're like, if I'm going too fast and you can't take enough notes, guess what? On our blog, Newcastle FBC, uh, we have the whole sermon manuscript there for you every Sunday. I send my sermon to a group of about 24 people every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. Um, so, the, so that I'm held accountable to, to a group of people in our church and also a couple of them tell, fix my grammar issues. And, uh, and, and so I got plenty of those, by the way. And, and then Mr. Kennard puts it on our blog. I wanna be 100% transparent with what I'm teaching. So everything is submitted, okay? I submit everything I do to others because I am with you in this. Okay, there's only one head, and who is he? Jesus. Say it again, one head who? Jesus. Amen, amen, we gotta remember that, otherwise we'll destroy each other. Matthew three, verses one to three. Check this out, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, by the way, this is gonna last old covenant prophet, okay? There's no one born of a woman greater than he. But all of you born of the Spirit are greater. Wow, Jesus said that. It's amazing to think. John the old covenant prophets as the one who would come to prepare the way for the Lord. Check this out. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, what was his message? Repent, which means return to me. Do a 180, come back to me. Stop doing the things of the lusts of this world. Stop doing things your own way and come back to me and my teaching. Come home. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And oh, by the way, in that next verse, we have a description of one of the prophets from Hebrews 11. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair, okay? So remember that there was prophets talked about wearing animal hair garments in Hebrews 11. Just interesting, a little aside there, okay? Now, John the Baptist here is preaching from, if you just turn like two pages or three pages back, you'll be in the Old Testament, Okay, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, right? It's one of the Gospels of Jesus. Gospel means good news. There's four Gospels, okay? The good news of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, those tell us the same story about Jesus and why he came and what he did to save us from our sins. A couple pages before that, you have the last prophet in the Old Testament, which, which is why I make it the distinction. Malachi is the last prophet in the canon of the Old Testament. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Covenant. The fulfillment, okay? So that's why I started like, oh, okay, I get it now. All right, Malachi 3, verses one to seven. Check this out. This is what John the Baptist fulfilled. Ready? Behold, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. That means he's going to bring righteousness. He's going to bring purity. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. That's what priests do. Priests offer right offerings to God in righteousness. For I, the Lord, do not change. Pay attention here. This is God speaking. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Here it is. Return to me, and I will return to you 
says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Oh, man, isn't that super exciting? Isn't that like, you say, okay, well, how shall I return? And then John the Baptist is the fulfillment of that. And then here comes Jesus. And what does Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He's answering the question. Jesus is fulfilling the ministry of the prophet. He's not closing the work of the prophet, but he's fulfilling the ministry of the prophet. Now that takes us to step three. How do we now mature into this person, okay? We've heard the word of faith spoken to us. We've read a lot of scripture, okay? We're getting the grace of God into us. Now how do we actually grow up in this knowledge? Did you hear God's emphasis in Malachi 3? From the days of their forefathers, from the beginning of Israel's rebellion, God has been calling all of his people to return to him, to come home. Now, I want you to turn a couple chapters in the Gospel of Luke to Luke 13, verse 34, and I want you to hear Jesus' prayer for Jerusalem. This is why we pray for Jerusalem, because the Scriptures command us to. Put your politics aside. And we pray according to what the word of God teaches us. Listen to Jesus and hear the longing of the Father in Jesus who is one with the Father. Luke 13, verse 34. This is so beautiful when you hear it in the light of John the Baptist and Jesus coming in fulfillment of these prophecies of the old covenant. You ready? Luke 13, verse 34 says, Jesus, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Do you hear the longing of that parent's heart? the longing of that mother's heart as that hen wanting to gather her brood under wings. Think of that maternal instinct to protect and bring home. What mother doesn't want her kids home? When it's past curfew and your kid's not home yet, what mother is not like, my baby needs to be home where it's safe? Jesus intentionally added his voice to that of the prophets. Okay, look at Matthew 4. We're staying in these gospels because we got to see Jesus here because it's all about Jesus fulfilling, bringing into the new covenant the same yearning heart of the Father. Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17. Now when Jesus heard that John, we're talking about John the Baptist, all right? When Jesus heard that John had, take, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. He was grieved in the spirit. And leaving Nazareth, he came and he settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. There it is again, another fulfillment of prophecy. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. Go read John 1 later. And those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And who is the light that dawned? It's Jesus, the coming of the Messiah. Verse 17, as the light of God, as the fulfillment of of God's word what did Jesus say from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent return to me come home for the kingdom of heaven is at hand the kingdom of heaven is God's rule over all of his creation it's God making all of his creation his home it's everything coming under his rule this is the gospel message. This is why Jesus came. This is why you are saved, so that you can come home and buy, find rest for your soul, find peace for your mind, find joy in your life. 
Jesus came to bring you home to the Father. He came to restore you into a right relationship with God. I want you to go to my favorite passage in Scripture now, and I'm going to make this come alive in a new way for you. I've taught this before, but it's been some years now. Go to Matthew 11, verses 20 to 30. And I want you to see the heart of God in Jesus. I want you to see, I want you to hear the Father's voice. I want you to hear prophets speaking through Jesus. Because this is going to shock some of you. Because many of you don't want to read the hard sayings of Jesus, just the meek and mild ones. But listen to Jesus, my Jesus. And I hope your Jesus too. And may this not, may it cause a stumbling block in you if it needs to. But may then the Spirit cause you to walk in the way of the Lord. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. What does it mean not to repent? It means they didn't go home. They didn't answer the call of returning home to God. So what did Jesus do? He denounced the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, which, caused, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and the day of judgment than for you. I hope that just burst your bubble about your understanding of meek and mild Jesus. Jesus comes with the same, no, he comes with even greater authority than the prophets. And he is speaking the word of the prophet to those who will not heed the call to repent. And he's saying it's going to be worse for you in the day of judgment than even the worst of sinners in the Old Testament. But then listen, Jesus doesn't stop there because now you need to see grace. You need to see the fulfillment of the word of prophecy. He's going to show them the way home, in other words. He's going to answer Malachi 3. Here it is, ready? At that time, Jesus said, this is verse 25, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you hear it? Do you hear the call of Jesus saying, come home, come home, all you cities. He's talking to the cities he just denounced. He's talking to the reprobate. He's talking to the apostate. He's talking to those who are in rebellion against God's word. He's talking to people who refuse to come in submission to God. And what is he saying to them? He says, God has given me all authority. And now what am I saying to you? Come to me. Come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my learning, my way, my truth onto yourself and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you hear Jesus calling out to you? Do you hear him saying, do not live in that rebellious posture of your heart. Come home to a right relationship with God. Bjorn, can you give me my water, please? <coughs> Come home to a right relationship with God. Thank you, son. Home is a place of rest. Home is a place of safety. 
Home is a place of peace which transcends all human understanding, guarding our hearts and minds. Home is a place of joy. Home is the place where God's comfort is made manifest. All is in Christ Jesus. And without the call of the prophet, without the call of the prophet, without the call of the prophet saying, you need to return to me. You need to repent for home is at hand. And I am the way in. Outside of a relationship with me, there is torment and there is gnashing of teeth there is weeping and there's wailing, but with me there is peace. There is life eternal. There is joy everlasting. Come in. I am the doorway. I am the gate for the sheep to enter. Without the call of the prophet, there could be no way for the wayward to return home, which means there would be no way for any of us in this room to have salvation and there will be no way for any of us to bear good fruit. For apart from him, we can do nothing. And that takes us to the conclusion. And the conclusion is found in the parable of the lost son. I'm not going to read the whole to you because many of you know the parable of the lost son. But for those of you who don't know it, it's found in your scriptures. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. And in this parable of the lost son, maybe we should say it's the parable of the lost sons, Jesus emphasized the heart of God through the prophetic, prophetic message of come home. This is what Jesus was doing in this whole chapter. And through it, he called all prodigals, all wayward children of Israel and Gentiles, to return to a right relationship with the Father. And he reminded the church, now listen, this is important. Okay, if you're all like thinking, okay, he's just gonna go to an evangelistic message. No, this is discipleship too. So church, you need to lean in. This is a double-edged prong here. We're, we're going after those who need to come home in the first place and those who need to bear fruit as messengers of the message that people need to come home, okay? So this is for all y'all starting with the message that God's been working in me all week because it's going to get hard here for a second. Ready? If I had a joke, I would tell it to you, but I don't have one. I'm not very funny. He is saying that we need to return to a right relationship with the Father, and he reminds the church here, and this is where it's really prophetic, Jesus is reminding the church that this is our prophetic task to all the nations. Siblings, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't for ourselves to become like the older son of this parable who refused to come home and celebrate the return of the lost. He stood outside of the home and refused to come in to the great celebration of the prodigal son. Church, we cannot become like him. And this is the prophetic message that Jesus had to the Pharisees in the great evangelistic call that all you who are weary and heading birdie can come and find rest. All of you have been prodigals and have lived lives apart from him. You can come home now. There's no reason to stay outside, come home. But to you who have been sitting in the pews doing the work, you need to come in too. We all need to come in to the great celebration. And the danger for the church, just as we saw the danger for the Pharisees, was that they became the religious elite. They became the self-righteous saints. They became a stumbling block, an obstacle to the throne of grace. To hear the hard teachings of Jesus for you to be broken upon the rock who is Jesus Christ, then so be it. May you be broken of your self-righteous pride, of your religious sense of he's mine because I've been going to church my whole life. Do you reflect him? Do you live him? Do you breathe him? Are you giving him to others? For that's what it means 
to bear good fruit, to live a life of praise. It's to not be a stumbling block on the way to the throne of grace. It's to be an introducer, an inviter, a witness. Jesus came, according to Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which was lost. That is the church's purpose. We exist to be a people who seek out those who are not yet home and say there's a great homecoming. Come home. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 20. Paul gives us here the ministry of reconciliation. So in one of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, the apostle Paul calls us ambassadors of Christ. Who does an ambassador represent? In the political realm, if you were the ambassador of the United States to Brazil, would you represent your own personal interest or the interest of the president? You would represent the interest of the president of the United States. Guess what? As an ambassador of Jesus Christ, you do not represent your own interest on social media. You do not represent your own political affiliations, your own opinions. You represent Jesus. And every time you represent your personal opinions, you push away 50% of the audience from hearing about Jesus. We're so divided as a nation that there's only one hope, and it's Jesus not your opinions. We need to crucify our flesh so that we may represent him as ambassadors. We must know him so well that when someone asks a question, when someone poses something, when someone comes up to and confronts us, we know how Jesus would respond. We train Jesus into our being. We've given over our lives to the Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit comes out of us, not the weeds of our flesh. And that will be tested with a refiner's fire. Who can stand the day of his coming? Paul said, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Thank you, Jesus. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's committed to us the prophetic message of the gospel. Therefore, we, not Jerry, not the elders or the officers or some other elected or appointed person, we the body of Christ, of which we are many members, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and we're going to close with this call to action. This message of the prophets is from cover to cover. This message of the prophets is fulfilled in Jesus and passed on to the apostles and then passed on to us today. The apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 in the earliest churches in Acts 2 verses 38 to 39, Peter carried on the message of the prophets, the message of John the Baptist, the message of Jesus, and he said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and it's for your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself did you hear that in carrying on the prophetic ministry of Jesus Christ as Peter did as the church has done for 2,000 years, as we will continue to do until the Lord returns, we will see God bring many sons and daughters back home into his household. And our lives will reap a harvest of praise to the glory of God because we are the church. And God has called his church to be hope bearers, not doomsdayers. We are the hope of the nations. We are God's plan A. There is no plan B. 
And God said, I am going to build my kingdom in you, and then it's going to overflow through you so that people will see my rule over your life, and they'll want to come home and have a part in this great story. And so, Father, you are calling all of the sons and daughters home today, here. I pray for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would hear from God today, that they would hear the love of the Father that so pointedly says, repent, turn away from the sin that so easily entangles you and ensnares you, that keeps you down, and be elevated. Set free from that sin through faith. So, Father, may you forgive us of our sins, for there are many. And we say, Yes, Lord, I believe I want to come home to you today. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Father, for those who have called upon your name today. May we be refreshed with this reminder that we join with the ministry of the prophets to have a faith that calls people home by witnessing to the nations of how good it is to abide in Christ, how good it is to find our dwelling place in him, how good it is to have his Holy Spirit living in us, how good it is to be forgiven of our sins, set free to live eternity. Oh, Father, bring salvation, bring sanctification, bring purpose, bring mission, bring focus, bring life as you call all of your children home to you. In Jesus' name.